Hey everybody, today is so exciting because I just finished up an epic shot project. That's exciting news. For years I've needed a proper outfit and assembly table and this one is packed with features. It's got a ton of storage for organizing small and large tools, aluminum rails for work holding, and on top of that a huge work area with an MFT style dog hole grid. Okay, there's a lot of work to do so let's get going. So to get started on this new assembly table, I'm going to cut the parts that make up the frame. And the wood I'm going to use for this is hard maple. I chose that because all the shop cabinets and stands I've built in the last couple of years are all maple, so this will match that look nicely. I like using maple for all my shop projects because it's a very dense, heavy wood that's easy to obtain in my area and relatively cheap compared to other hardwoods. It'll give the assembly table a lot of mass and also take a good beating from day-to-day -day work. After I chop all these boards down to rough length at the miter saw, I've got one fat stack of boards that need to be milled flat and square. So I send everything across the joiner to get one face totally flat before I put that face against the fence and square up one edge. Then I can run them through the planer to get a nice flat surface on the other face. I love sticking rough lumber into the planer and watching it come out the other side nice and clean. It's so magical. Next, I head over to the table saw to cut everything to rough width using the square edge that I made at the joiner. But more importantly, look at how I'm playing it cool and pretending that I didn't notice that I forgot to turn on the dust collection. Ah, uh, there's just nothing like a good dusting of man glitter to make you feel like a real woodworker. Okay, with all my parts milled up, it's time to glue up some leg blanks. I'm using two pieces of 8 quarter maple sandwiched together to make one leg blank. This will give me enough material to mill the legs down to a final dimension of three and a half inches square. I like just using my built-in glue spreader here because I'm lazy and I don't want to walk all the way over to get a silicone brush out of the drawer. That's like five steps away. I'm also gluing multiple pairs of legs together to save on clamps. Just make sure you don't accidentally glue them together into one mega leg. And while those glue ups are drying, I need to cut all my other frame parts to final length and I like to gang similar pieces together. This helps in making the final assembly square because it guarantees that all the corresponding sides are exactly the same length. And once those leg blanks come out of the clamps, I run them back across the joiner on two sides to clean up those joints and get two flat square sides. Then back through the planer to get the other two sides flat and square as well. Look at those nice crisp clean legs looking so good. But after all that milling I've been doing, my dust collector was alerting me that it was time to empty the drum. Look at all that lumber just reduced to termite food. But that's the price you pay to get good, clean, straight lumber. All right, now that we're all depressed, let's get happy again and cut these legs to final length. Look at those beautiful legs. Doesn't that make you feel better? Next up, joinery. And here's a tip for any time you need to cut joinery in table legs. Once you've decided the orientation that you want for your legs, group them together and draw a diamond on top of the legs. This is a great way to remember which face of your legs are going to get joinery cut in them because all you have to do is look for which face the line touches. Once I marked out all my joints on the legs, it was time to put this in easy mode and use my domino to cut all the mortises. You definitely don't have to have a domino for this. You could use a drill and dowling jig or you could cut traditional mortise and tenons which will both be just as good but take way longer to cut. If you could only afford to buy one tool from Festool, the domino should be it. In my opinion, there's no better combination of speed and accuracy for joinery. I also need to cut mortises in the ends of all the other frame parts, which is easy too. Just point and shoot. The only legs that don't get dominoes are the middle support legs. Those are going to be added later, and I need to cut some big notches in them to support the long stretchers. To do this, I put my dado stack in the table saw and hogged out all that material. Again, you don't need a dado stack. You could do this with a regular ripping blade on a table saw, but you'll be cutting these notches one blade width at a time, so just refer back to my previous ramblings about using tools to save time. Okay, enough of all that. It's finally time to bang this thing together, so I start by adding some glue and tapping in dominoes. This is my favorite part of assembly because everything just fits together so easily without additional tools other than a small persuader and some clamps. I decided the best way to tackle this was to assemble the long sides first, which would be the front and back sides. I'm putting this together all by myself, so gluing the whole frame all in one shot was just not likely to end well. 
To get these clamped up, I had to break out my extra long pipe clamps. This is where pipe clamps really saved my bacon because it would be expensive if not impossible to find parallel or f-style clamps of this size. One thing about pipe clamps though is that they can exert a lot of force quickly, enough that I can easily bend this stretcher. So if this happens to you, just back off the clamping pressure until you see both the pipe and the board straighten out again. That'll be plenty of force to hold the joints together. Okay, fast forward and both the long sides are out of the clamps. But before I continue building, this is a great time to install leveling feet. Any type of outfeed table should have these because you never want to try to build it exactly to the height of your table saw. And unless you have dead flat floors, there's always going to be one side slightly higher than the other. All that headache can be avoided by just making your table about a half inch short and adding nice beefy leveling feet. I just countersink a tiny bit to allow for this plate to sit flush and then I can drill down into the leg. Then I can just screw this thingy to the leg and make sure to drill pilot holes first. Then the feet just screw in and now this table is going to be fully adjustable to get it to just the right height. Okay, now I need to add a bunch of dominoes to all these mortises. I don't know why, but tapping in dominoes is one of the most satisfying feelings. And now I'm realizing I'm going to have to take this thing to the floor before I can add the sides and stretchers. And these just slide right over those dominoes and into place. Sometimes you got to tap them a little bit. And I make sure to add some support under the middle to make pressing these stretchers on a little bit easier. Okay, now comes the most stressful part of the whole build. Somehow I need to make these 20 dominoes line up perfectly with the 20 mortises before all this glue begins to dry. Once I got this side lined up, I worked on the other end and slowly but surely every domino fell into place. Get it? Dominoes? Falling into place? Never mind. Even without clamps, this thing is rigid enough to flip it upright. And that's when my plan almost hit a major snag. My longest parallel clamps are 50 inches, and I've got plenty of those on hand. But this frame is 52 inches wide. Right before I began cursing my lack of forethought, I discovered that by luck I could squeeze a couple more inches out of these clamps and they just fit, and I was able to apply clamping force. Crisis averted. I get everything clamped up, and surprisingly, everything is pretty square. But let's say in your case that it's not, what would you do? If you suspect that it's not, just take a tape measure and measure it from corner to corner and see if it's the same distance than the other corners. If one direction is a little longer than the other one, apply a light amount of clamping pressure to those corners and then check it again until both diagonal measurements are the same. So while that glue up is drying, I can move on to cutting the cabinet parts. For the cabinet sides and bottom, I'm using 3 quarter inch pre-finished maple ply, the same thing that I build all my other shop cabinets from. First, I like to rip off the ragged factory edge and make them nice and crispy. Once that's done, I can cut everything to final dimensions. Okay, now I'm going to attach these center support legs, and these are going to prevent the middle of the table from sagging over time, as well as provide a nice visual divider between the two banks of drawers. So installing these legs is pretty simple really, I just need to find the exact center of the apron and lower stretchers and mark that position. Then I can mark the exact center of the legs. After that I just add some glue to these notches and line up the marks on the legs with the marks on the table. Then I'll just add a couple clamps before doing the same thing on the back side. Now with those legs installed, I can begin installing the cabinets. I start by countersinking some holes into the side panels with this cool countersink drill bit and then I can clamp the panels into place. Then, with cat-like nimbleness, I maneuver my way into the center of the table. I have a couple of friends that call me Whiskers. <laughs> and that's where I'll just screw these panels into place. And now to maneuver to the other side for more fun with contortion. And with all the side panels in place, I can go take some ibuprofen and work on installing the back panels. These are pretty easy, but I did need to cut a notch in the top to make way for the center support to run through it. You'll see what I mean in a minute. This notch is easy enough to cut with a jigsaw and a drill bit can make a nice little relief to quickly remove the center and clean up the bottom of the notch. And now you can see how it slides over that center support so I can screw it into the side panels. And down at the bottom, I added some small plywood cleats and this is gonna give me a place to drop in the bottom of the cabinets. Because these cabinets will be filled with drawers, a bottom panel is kind of unnecessary. However, it will keep the cabinets free of dust, cobwebs, and any kind of critter who might try to make their home in here. 
This also gives you the flexibility that if you don't want all those drawers but would rather have shelves and doors, you can still use this cabinet for storage. Okay, so behind the cabinets, I'm going to add more cleats. This time the cleats are full length because I plan on storing a bunch of items like air compressors and jigs back here, and so these bottoms need to be able to hold that weight. Now that that's done, I need to fill these cabinets with drawers. I like making my drawers out of 5 8 inch Baltic birch ply. It has a clean look and 5 8 of an inch is the perfect size even for larger drawers. I'm going to go ahead and make it easy on myself and make all these drawers the same size because past me knew that future me would want this part of the project done quickly, so I just set the distance on my fence and cut all my parts. And then I cut a groove down all the sides to capture the drawer bottoms. This is easily done with a single saw blade. You just sneak up on the cut until the drawer bottom fits just like this. Now, for all of you who may be thinking that I'm some kind of elitist woodworker who only uses Festool, you can think again because I love using pocket holes to build all my drawers. I think this is the perfect application for them. Quick to do and all the pockets are hidden. Even my solid maple kitchen drawers have pocket hole construction. And for drawer assembly, I adhere to the KISS model. Just keep it simple. With my parts aligned like this, they fold up and I can align the joints and make sure they're nice and square before I add a pair of clamps. I pop in my pocket screws and I find glue to be optional here. If you did add glue to these, just make sure to tape off the inside of those joints so that the glue squeeze out is easy to remove. And then I can just slide the bottom in from the back side and tap it into the groove in the front of the drawer. I like adding screws here, especially for shop drawers, because they're going to end up holding a good amount of weight. And I just repeat that process five more times and all my drawers are done. Now to install these, I'm using undermount drawer slides. You can save some money for sure and use side mount slides, but I already had a ton of these undermounts on hand from all my cabinet projects. In my opinion though, if you build drawers using this method that I showed you, then installing undermount slides is a breeze and there's so much more adjustability. Don't worry, I won't bore you with any more talk about drawer slides, but I do have a video explaining my dead simple process for installing them that I'll leave a link to in the description below. And in the meantime, I'll wow and amaze you with this crudely edited animation. So wouldn't you know it, I decided that I didn't need all this dead space on the back side of the table and that I could squeeze in one more bank of drawers if I planned my cuts correctly with my remaining plywood. I quickly cut some new parts and assembled the cabinet outside of the table using screws for the bottom as well as the back. And now if I made all my measurements accurately, this thing should just drop straight in from the top. Bam! I secured it with a few screws from the inside and whipped up three more small drawers. So for the drawer fronts, I'm making them all out of pre-finished maple ply. The only additional step is adding edge banding for a clean look. All right, so with the new bench basically done, it's getting really tight in here and I need to get it into position, which means I need to get rid of the old bench. So I'm gonna need a minute to say goodbye to my old bench. Ah, who am I kidding? Let's get it out of here. Okay, so I'm not going to make you watch me tear this old bench apart, but I did have one tip that I wanted to share, and that's before you discard any cabinetry or shop furniture, make sure to salvage as much usable hardware as possible. Things like drawer pulls, hinges, and slides, because those things are all expensive and easily reused in future shop projects. Okay, with the new assembly table in its place, I have a lot more breathing room and I can go ahead and add the finishing touches to the base cabinet, starting with the drawer fronts. Since these cabinets are inset, I can add spacers to the bottom rail and position the drawer front where I want it and then fasten it to the cabinet using the holes that I made for the pull. Then I can just fasten the drawer from the back side before removing those two screws and drilling the holes completely through. Then I can just install my drawer pull and then do that same process two more times. So one thing that my old table had that this new one won't have is a vise. And so that means I need to come up with a new solution for vertical work holding and I think I may have found it with this aluminum extrusion. The only problem is how to access the slots with these legs in the way. So my first thought was to create a wooden spacer that was thick enough to extend the slots beyond the face of the legs and the rail's gonna fasten to the spacer with these drop-in T-bolts. 
I just used my old friend two-sided tape to secure the spacer while I drilled the pilot holes into the apron. Then, with the T-bolts in the rails, I slid the bolts through the holes and fastened them with washers and nuts on the back side. So now I can access these slots with my Festool clamps, and even my Microjig dovetail clamps will fit, which makes me super pumped. I was so happy that I went ahead and added a second rail to the end of the table. And the final little bit of detail to add to the base was to cover the exposed plywood edges with a piece of trim. This is nothing fancy, it's just glued in place and clamped with painter's tape. Okay, so with the base finished, I can focus on the top, which I'm making out of MDF. I don't want anything complicated like a torsion box, and I don't think it needs to be real thick because I have all those thick supports built into the frame of the table. But to really make the top pop, I'm going to laminate it with this sheet of black Formica. Formica is used every day to make kitchen countertops, and it's pretty durable and wear resistant. Wood glue won't stick to it, and with it being black, stains and other blemishes are going to be harder to see. You can get this stuff in lots of different places. I like to get mine from my local plywood dealer, but you can also order it online through your local Lowe's or Home Depot and have it shipped to the store or even directly to you in a roll. It's easy to cut with this special scoring tool that kind of looks like a sawtooth welded to the end of a hook knife. And once you score it, it snaps pretty easily right on the score line. And if you're brave enough, you can even cut it on your table saw, which I don't really recommend. It's kind of like trying to cut a giant flour tortilla on your table saw. So the go-to method for laminating Formica is contact cement. The good news is, is that contact cement is really simple to use. You can just roll or brush it on, and within 15 minutes, it's tacky to the touch. The bad news is this stuff has a powerful noxious odor and you really need to use it in a well-ventilated space until it fully cures. You can't see it, but behind the camera, my garage door is wide open so that these fumes can escape. Once both sides are dry to the touch, I can just place some spacers between the two surfaces and line the laminate up carefully. Then, working from the middle, I remove one spacer at a time, pressing the Formica down. Contact cement forms a powerful bond, so you want to go slowly. And once I have all the spacers out, I use this special roller to press the Formica into place and drive out any air pockets that might compromise the bond. And then you can use a trim router literally to do the job that the tool was designed for and flush trim this laminate to the edge of the MDF. And just like that, I've got a nice Darth Vader looking top. So I'm making my top in two halves and I'm doing that for a reason. I have one more feature in mind that I want to add to the top. A while back I asked my viewers what kind of work holding they liked on their work tables and the clear majority said dog holes were preferred. And I have to say I'm in the same camp. I have an MFT workstation that's in the front of the shop and I love being able to use bench dogs and fences and clamps in the same system so I want to replicate that on one half of my new assembly table. To create the MFT style grid of holes, there are several options like the UJK Parf Guide system or there are other YouTubers who've developed accurate ways of doing this job. But I have a faster and easier way, which is a CNC. And this is the perfect job for it. After designing up the hole pattern in my design software, I let the CNC do the precision cutting. I will though link to that Parf Guide system below and I'll also link some videos that explain how to use it and create an MFT style top. And of course, you could skip the holes altogether and just install T-Tracks or go blank slate and have a fresh, clean worktop. And then to protect the edges, I'm trimming it out with some maple edge banding. I could have easily added this edge banding before I laminated the top had I had just one ounce of forethought. Oh well, still looks good though. To secure the top to the base, I drilled some pocket holes along the perimeter. This way, if I need to replace either half of the table, it's just as simple as unscrewing it, and I don't have to deal with replacing the entire top if I don't need to. And since this is an outfeed table, the last little detail I need to add is to route two slots to match up with the miter slots on the table saw. To do this, I'm just using a router with a one inch rabbiting bit. I used a strip of wood that's secured with two-sided tape to be my guide and I took it in a couple passes just to be safe. Now my miter gauge or crosscut slit can slide without running into the edge of the outfeed table. And just like that, this thing is ready to go to work. Whew, that was a lot of work, but this thing is ready to go and I couldn't be more stoked. If there are any other features you think that I should add to this in a future video, go ahead and let me know down in the comments below. Thanks for watching this video and please subscribe if you're not already. And until next time, 
have fun in the shop.